Today we have guest lecturer Naufil Abu Baud with us. He is the executive director and co-founder of the Nordic Center for Conflict Transformation and the director of the Center for Applied Research in Conflict Transformation. A native of Morocco, as well as a Swedish national with more than 18 years of experience in the field of conflict transformation, human rights, democratization process, and in multi-program management. Nofal Abubawud has expert professional experience through innovative and transformational program in the Middle East and North Africa, the Sahel region, and Southeast Asia. He managed large portfolio that included several projects and research program that shape global policies in conflict and peace field. He has special professional expertise in security process with a particular focus on terrorism, violent extremism, rehabilitation, and post-prison reintegration, including returnee fighters. His work is anchored on achieving a more global understanding of the drivers of violence through innovative and context-specific program. He directed work in conflict transformation in prison in Morocco, Mali, and Niger, the design, monitoring, and evolution of peace building program on decreasing violence and increasing women effective participation in peace building and community resilience. Mr. Abu Baud holds a Master of Law in International Law from the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies and an International Masters of Arts in Human Rights from Mahidul University in Thailand. He is pursuing a doctorate in political science at the University of Paris. He has multiple publications, including Islamic law and human rights monologue or dialogue, regenerating the state in the Arab world and the role of European Union in democracy building. Mr. Abu Baud, thanks for joining us. Um, we are looking forward to discuss uh, with you very crucial topic. So everyone has interest in this topic. Thanks so much for joining. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Naomi Sharin. Thank you for CREA University for arranging this and for this collaboration with the Nordic Center for Conflict Transformation. Uh, thank you to the, all the students that you have there. And um, thank you to those who join us uh, uh, remotely. Uh, indeed, a very interesting topic. Uh, and uh, it comes the time when uh, this topic needs to be discussed by the academia, more on, mostly on a scientific uh, perspective, rather than uh, various opinions and reports from various organizations. Uh, I think my uh, overall goal from my intervention is not to tell all the students there that uh, I hold some truth on this particular problems regarding uh, the fight against violent extremism. But rather, I try to a little bit increase the curiosity among the students and among the academia about this crucial topic. And I hope that at one point, you know, um, we will see more academic research and more students specializing in uh, research on the factors uh, on the policies uh, an assessment of policies regarding uh, violent extremism uh, and terrorism. Uh, uh, it's also very much linked to the idea of to what extent uh, the fight of violent extremism has impacted the freedoms of religion. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Naomi and uh, your communication team by adding in the neck, the other poster you add the S uh, on freedoms. Uh, and the myths, uh, you add an S, is very much uh, correct. And uh, this is what I'm going to be talking about. So basically, when we're talking about terrorists, terrorists is, uh, is uh, uh, people who know, are trained uh, on how to use uh, weapons and, uh, and uh, weaponry in general. Uh, uh, people who are have raised their level of violence to what to an extent that is beyond uh, what what the ordinary is, and also that they have an extended network of uh, uh, like-minded uh, terrorists. What I like to do is also here uh, speak about a little bit. Uh, one of the challenges when we speak about terrorists is within the idea of prosecution, um, 
uh, it's very hard to uh, to have evidence against these people for, for various reasons. Uh, one, for example, we are not, for example, when you talk about Daesh and Al-Qaeda in Iraq and Syria, well, most of the state, if not all, they are not in Syria. Uh, and um, with an exception, of course, with one or two states, uh, they, most of the state do not have uh, uh, diplomatic uh, relations with the Assad regime. And also, um, it's very hard to exchange the data. Uh, so we want to make sure that when we speak about terrorists, that there are some kind of evidence. Uh, most of the terrorists uh, that we talk about, those who were um, arrested because of terrorist activities, uh, they were arrested because they joined a terrorist organization. And even with that evidence, the sentence to, given regarding that is quite low. It's between five and, um, and 10 years. Uh, most of them, they, they would go towards a um, rehabilitation program. And uh, most of them do not actually spend more than three years uh, in jail and they will come out. So uh, another challenge is that these people are not um, uh, prosecuted. Uh, on evidence based regarding the violation of international humanitarian law. Uh, uh, every country is mandated, in fact, to uh, investigate uh, citizens' uh, involvement in violations of international humanitarian law, whether they are involved in uh, crime of wars or crime against humanity or crime of genocide. Just a couple of them have been prosecuted some in Germany mostly. And uh, what's interesting about the prosecution regarding international humanitarian law is that the sentences are quite big. It's around 25 years in jail to 30, and they are cumulative, cumulative to um, uh, the uh, uh, crimes to join in a terrorist organization, which is between five and 10, and that has to be cumulative. So it's uh, the issue here is that one of the challenges that we have is that to what extent uh, these people were persecuted uh, on violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, also, one other challenge here is about the definitions. Uh, we're talking about radicalization, about radicalism, about violent extremism, and, and about terrorism. Uh, and here, you know, we there there are several reports uh, and several studies regarding the definitions, and until today, unfortunately, we don't have a clear cut definition regarding all these topics and subjects, which is a challenge in terms uh, of prosecution, but also a challenge for all the organizations working on prevention aspects and also uh, organizations that are working on. Uh, international human rights law and the application of justice. Uh, but I will try to, to share some of general ideas about this, these topics uh, and, and definitions that have been given. We will look at them a little bit analytically and uh, critically. Um, we will then move towards uh, the idea of the linkages between religion and terrorism and I will ask the students whether this question, can a religion be violent extremist? Uh, so we'll look into that as well. Uh, and then um, there are 10 points there that I would like to end with regarding the challenges. And perhaps those are topics for research for the students uh, to say that we, as an organization, the Nordic Center for Conflict Transformation will be very happy to help and support those students who would like to conduct research on the topic. Another thing that I would like to raise here is um, the reports that have been uh, out there. I, I have shared with you, for example, the, the Global Terrorism Index, uh, which is an annual report that is um, uh, established by the Institute for Economics and Peace. Very interesting topic. And very interesting reports, uh, quantitative reports. You can see several trends of terrorism globally. And um, uh, I've been following it for at least 12 years now. And it's very interesting for you guys you know, to, to look at it very closely uh, uh, and also look at it from perspective of uh, country basis as well. 
So um, uh, let's start with radicalization. And uh, uh, we, we hear this word a lot. And um, what basically means uh, uh, is that the, the group of people are challenging the legitimacy uh, of established norms and laws uh, 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 and, uh, and policies. And uh, the idea is that it doesn't really uh, uh, lead to violence. It doesn't really, really in itself uh, 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 is considered as a violence. Uh, so it just uh, refuses sometimes the values of that particular country and their policies. And this is a definition that was given by the European Institute for Peace. Uh, it rejects the values of society, basically. But um, uh, this is radicalism. Uh, and radicalization is a little bit different. Radicalization is based on two elements. One is the exposure to, to extremist narratives. And we can talk about those extremist narratives. And uh, the second thing is to uh, accept the ideology uh, coming from those, uh, those extremist ideas. Uh, but it's not necessarily, these are only views at this particular time. Uh, they are not necessarily leading to violence. It's only a minority that are actually impacted by these ideas and resort to violence, very, very small minority. So it, 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 it's, you know, the question was, is what are these exposure to these narratives? It's very interesting to talk about what are the narratives that uh, can be considered that have been used as to, to, to be considered as narrative of extremism. There are some studies that actually uh, differentiated between at least two narratives, the narratives when we are looking at the, of Al-Qaeda and the narratives of Daesh. Uh, there are two different uh, narratives. One is based on the narratives or discourses of grievances, these Al-Qaeda, and the other ones are the narratives based on the uh, the discourse of dreams. Uh, um, also, I would like to mention here that these narratives are not exclusive to Al-Qaeda and uh, Daesh. They're actually borrowed from the nation's uh, nationalism and the idea of uh, narrative in relation to, to nationalism. And I have shared with you the Benedict Anderson Imagine Communities, and you can have a little bit more ideas about how those narratives regarding nationalism have been formed. And it's actually those narratives that have been uh, remodeled by uh, Al-Qaeda Al and uh, Daesh and use them to, uh, to their uh, goals. Uh, so basically, Al-Qaeda, for a long time, we heard their, their narratives. They're at least based on several points and discourses. I would like to share with you the five main ones. So the, 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 the first narrative that had been used by, by uh, Al-Qaeda is colonialism. So basically, they, they tell young people why you are suffering in your country, why you have problems, why you are not happy. It's because of colonialism. Uh, uh, the second one is about the double standards. So the idea of why, for example, is OK to, to to burn the Koran, for example, in, in, in Nordic countries, but other in Muslim countries were not allowed to burn, for example, that they can burn, for example, the flag or something like this. The same idea about why non-Muslim, for example, uh, countries are not allowed to have nuclear weapons and uh, non-Muslims have the right to have a, a nuclear weapon. So these are the double standards and the double standards about the West and all of that. The third narrative is uh, about humiliation. It's like how the Muslims are humiliated, not only in the uh, in, in, in Muslim world, but also outside Muslim worlds, how the Prophet Muhammad was portrayed, for example, in Denmark, uh, and making fun of, uh, uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, and uh, uh, why, for example, they show pictures of how uh, the Muslims were humiliated, tortured in Abu Ghraib prison. Um, the fourth narrative relates to the uh, conflict between Palestine and Israel and how the West is supporting the Israelis uh, against uh, uh, the Palestinians and how the, in, the world injustice has been 
supported by the West. Uh, and the fifth one is regarding natural resources. How Muslim countries have been seeing their natural, natural resources have been used by the West uh, and uh, how the West has implanted uh, leaders that actually look into the interests of the West rather than the interests of Muslim countries. So these are the narratives of Al-Qaeda. Uh, what I wanted to, to do is to reflect a little bit on these narratives. Uh, do you think you can produce counter narratives to these narratives? Uh, it's it's quite very hard because there is some truth regarding this. Uh, so uh, those who worked on deconstructing narratives, they found it a little bit very hard to deconstruct uh, the narratives of Al-Qaeda. And that is why we still see that Al-Qaeda, despite the war in Afghanistan, despite the war in Iraq and Syria and everything else, it's still ongoing. Al-Qaeda re-emerging slowly uh, uh, and, until today. Regarding Daesh, Daesh is basically uh, a copy-paste of the narratives of nationalism, uh, which are based on the dreams, the dream of unity, the dream of dignity, and the dream of salvation. And these narratives have been used by uh, empires in the past, the, the British Empire, and how the idea of uh, uh, dying for the for for the nation and so forth like that. So uh, it's uh, the dream of unity is the idea that they say that one day they will all the Muslims will be living together in a country. This is what we have they have been dreaming about for a long period of time. They have been divided by the colonialists, and uh, the Aisha will come and will reestablish the. Uh, uh, the the glory time of uh, uh, of the Islamic State. The second one is uh, regarding dignity. And here is more of a language of human rights. So many people, they will talk about the idea that uh, Daesh are completely against human rights. No, Daesh actually uses the language of human rights to say that they are reestablishing the human dignity of people. And the third one is the, the, the dream of salvation, is the idea as uh, in the territory where Daesh will be uh, operating, they will make sure there are laws and values that everyone else will go to heaven. Yeah, they will prepare the conditions for people to go. So these are the narratives of violent extremism that can lead a little bit to some of the uh, radical ideas. One thing that we do is that when we speak about violent extremists or terrorists, we always imagine there is one style, one kind. Yeah. But our work uh, in the Nordic Center, uh, we have at least established at least three categories that are very much obvious now of uh, those who are involved in violent extremism. The first category are, we call them the initiators. Mm -hmm. So the initiators, which you're talking about Osama bin Laden, you're talking about uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, all those who actually initiated the idea of violent extremism. As a matter of fact, we don't know where they come from. We don't know who funds them. And we don't know even when they, are, when they die where they are. So uh, it's very hard. There is a lot of conspiracy theories around them. Uh, so so uh, our work is very hard to say that we are actually, we can work in preventing the initiation of the idea of violent extremism. So it's, uh, it's very, the initiators are very hard. This is a category that we don't work with. The second category are the mercenaries. And we have seen, for example, the plight of mercenaries around the world, and especially in the Sahel region, in all wars. The idea these people are, they can infiltrate groups uh, with the idea to make money out of their involvement in violent extremism. Uh, uh, we have seen, for example, the Wagner Group uh, and uh, uh, the hate and love story between Wagner Group and terrorist groups. Sometimes they recruit from terrorist groups and sometimes the terrorist groups are fighting with the Wagner Group. So the, the idea is that we need to separate somebody who can infiltrate a group. It puts ideas about that particular group, even though the, the goal is not the same. The goal is not to get to the dreams of the age, but the goal is actually to make money out of the uh, the, the, the terrorist attacks and, uh, and uh, to make money out of any war that exists. And we, we saw the, for example, shifting 
around. So they came, for example, some of them, they came from different uh, African countries, from Asia, from uh, Europe, uh, and, uh, and from Russia as well. And then uh, they would, you would see them moving from the Sahel region, then you will find them in the Ukraine war, and then you find them again in Libya. So they keep, keep turning. So those is a challenge actually to make a difference between those and the real terrorists. The third category is what we 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 uh, call them is the dreamers. Those are actually uh, they are not happy where they are, and they they are looking for uh, for an adventure or for somewhere where they can feel better or can feel that they can have their dreamland, whatever. So these this is the category that we work with, and this is the most. Uh, of all of them, of all the mercenaries. The mercenaries need a very uh, focused security approach with prosecution. Uh, and uh, even on in terms of the rehabilitation, we need to separate the third category with the second category because you can't be working on uh, on the way of thinking, on, uh, on, on religious texts with mercenaries. So we need to, to work with the other ones. The other challenge here is that where is the role of women in all of that. If you look at the report, for example, uh, the interesting report of the Institute for Economics and Peace, uh, the Global Terrorism Index, uh, all those years, there is no segregation between men and women uh, in relation to the trends of terrorism. Uh, so, uh, you know, the in the beginning, uh, we tend to victimize women, that they were all victims of terrorism and terrorists until the world has been shocked by seeing the picture of this woman called Sejda uh, after the terrorist attack in Amman in Jordan. So she was shown in the national TV, in Jordanian national TV, wearing the um, uh, explosive uh, belt, uh, which didn't explode the time at the time of the, uh, uh, the, the attack. Unfortunately, uh, we don't know much about it. She was prosecuted and put in jail, but nothing that really came out out of her involvement, how and why, and uh, to, to what extent we could actually use her data, her you know, views to be able to prevent, uh, or at least to rethink the place of women in violent extremism. The other one uh, is a story, for example, of... Uh, 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 she is uh, uh, French Moroccan. Uh, she was in. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Fatiha Mjati. Uh, she she her story is very important because no matter what and no matter what she did, she was still considered as a victim. She she talked to her her. She told her story to everybody on the national news and everywhere that she actually radicalized somebody else who was also from a French father and a Moroccan mother. His name is Karim Mejati. So she took his name actually. And she was saying that she was younger than her and she actually um, radicalized him. And then Karim Mejati was found uh, behind the, the Madrid attacks, the London attacks, major attacks in Europe, and also the attacks in Riyadh. And he died after a shootout between, between him and the security in Saudi Arabia. And uh, he died, and his, uh, his son, one of the sons, also died, unfortunately. Um, where... Uh, Fatiha Mujate now, she, she moved, she was with Al-Qaeda and then she moved to Daesh and she worked on actually recruiting more people into that. So there was no prosecution for, for, for that one. It's very interesting to look into, into, into the place of women. Unfortunately, there is not much. Uh, uh, and uh, here will come actually, uh, what do we mean by uh, uh, extre extremism in itself? So the idea of looking into uh, the narrative of us versus them. This is how they think. Uh, uh, it requires also a closed-off group, uh, an environment with like-minded people. Uh, 
for example, the Arabic uh, thinker Al Muhammad Al Jabri, he says that it's normal to have extremism. It's uh, uh, extremism. It is extremism because it is in the extremes of the society. The problem is it starts when the base of society becomes extremist. Uh, so uh, it, for him, whether we go into completely eradicate uh, extremism is almost impossible. Uh, and uh, the the only uh, uh, the only uh, change that uh, it, it needs to be done is to be actually to decrease the number of the extremes uh, and reverse uh, their political engagement to political opinion and deal with it as 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 such. Um, uh, and uh, where is precisely now extremism? Uh, you know, reports and many organizations has actually uh, uh, differentiated between two ideas. See, extremist speech, that's the first one. Uh, this is a part of what uh, a violent extremism can be. And the extremist action. Uh, and this is the terrorist, uh, terrorist uh, activities, which is defined on uh, resolution 1566 of the U U UN General Assembly in 2004. It's quite broad and general, and it's very important that uh, you guys can uh, look into that as well and how we can actually restrict a little bit the definition as defined by the United Nations uh, Se uh, General Security Council, sorry, not General Assembly. And uh, looking into the context in which that definition was put into the uh, resolution 1566, it was right after the uh, the September 11th attack, uh, and it was uh, done under the pressure of the United States uh, to keep uh, as broad as possible the definition of terrorism. So um, from here, uh, uh, I would like to, to to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, another challenge that we have to face is actually the far-right extremism. Uh, uh, we have seen a mountain uh, speech and hate speech from far-right extremist political parties, uh, and also uh, far right, those who adopt the, their ideas. And what we realize is that all their narratives is actually based on the, uh, the theory, what they call it, the great replacement theory. The great replacement theory is something that says that uh, well, for example, uh, uh, the Muslims are planning to raise their demographics uh, and, and uh, soon in so-and-so years, they will replace so-and-so uh, religion or so-and-so people or migrants will be replacing us uh, uh, as a demography. I, 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 there is a lot of uh, misconception about that. Um, uh, and um, uh, there were reports and articles that have been uh, addressing the, the, the idea of uh, the, the replacement theory that have been used by far extremists, I think. There is even, for example, if I give you uh, that they say, for example, 50% of uh, the Hindus, for example, they will be uh, converted to Islam and 40% of them, they will be killed. Uh, well, actually, Muslims in India, it's only 14%. Uh, and also, it's very interesting to look into the fertility rates among Muslims that is dropping as well, and uh, the use of uh, uh, contraceptions uh, among Muslims actually have raised from 22% uh, to almost 66%. So these are, for example, only some of the criteria by which we can actually look into this uh, 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 replacement theory. Uh, uh, finally, uh, uh, the question that I was I was asking is, uh, can a religion be extremist? Uh, and uh, to what extent a religion can be extremist, uh, violent extremist? It's, uh, uh, how we can approach this from uh, a purely uh, academic perspective is actually, is, it will be very interesting to look into uh, the given religion from its declared overall goal. Uh, for example, if you're looking at, uh, say, uh, the Sharia law in Islam, it's very interesting to look into uh, the overall declared goal of that Sharia. Same thing, for example, with Hinduism. 
it, it will be very interesting to look into the overall uh, uh, goal of uh, Hinduism, for example, or Buddhism or, or, or I don't know, um, uh, Judaism or Christianity. Um, so for example, if you look at, uh, from what I know is, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, overall goal of Hinduism is to achieve the moksha by uh, breaking free from the samsara, which means actually to do good and good deeds. Yeah. And uh, for example, when you look at the overall goal declared of Islam, we call, we call them in Arabic maqasid al-sharia, which is the overall goals of the sharia. There are at least five. Uh, one is the protection of life, the second is the protection of property, the protection of health, protection of religion, and protection of dignity. And I know uh, an unpublished <laughs> uh, a report and study that has uh, taken these uh, four uh, elements uh, to assess a little bit uh, how Islamic countries, states are in, in general. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, ironically, uh, many of the countries that were actually declared as Islamic states based on these uh, five elements were not uh, Islamic states. Uh, I give you an example, one of the most Islamic states based on, on, on these five objectives, which is such as, uh, protection of life, of property, of health, of religion and dignity were actually countries in Scandinavia. One of them was Sweden, actually, <laughs> which is the funny. So it, it's very important to start thinking uh, uh, that uh, scientifically when we talk about uh, religion, when we talk about extremism, to actually determine uh, from the beginning what are these, uh, uh, what are the criteria by which we need to assess these, these religions. So I will... Um, uh, quickly uh, move to what are where are we uh, uh, as a, in the challenges regarding uh, freedom of expression, uh, uh, freedom of religion. Sorry. Uh, first, uh, when we look at freedom of religion, we have to understand that this is freedoms with S in the end. Uh, it's uh, it's defined in under the uh, the. Um, uh, uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, and basically, it's not only uh, the, the, the right to worship or to adopt a belief, it's also the right to conscience, the right to hold an opinion, the right to freedom of thought. It's also the freedom of assembly and freedom of expression. Uh, uh, a point here is that the freedom of uh, thoughts and freedom of conscience and freedom of opinion are absolute rights and absolute freedom. You One cannot restrict, restrict them. You can't get into people's mind and try to restrict those opinions and those ideas. You can engage a person in debate. You might change it. He might change the opinion, but it's uh, completely his or her choice in doing so. While a freedom of assembly and freedom of expression are quite limited by the laws of the country, freedom of expression, Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, restricts it uh, in the third paragraph if the freedom of expression uh, threatens the uh, a public order. Uh, and here, uh, freedom of expression, uh, there is a whole debate about uh, for example, the burning of Quran in uh, in Sweden and in Denmark and some Scandinavian countries, whether it's supposed to be a freedom of expression or not. There is um, an, uh, a case at the European Court of Human Rights, I think it's in 2000, uh, uh, I think it's 2004 or 2005. I might share it, I will share it with you. The idea is this, it's called uh, uh, Preminger versus Austria. And uh, Preminger was a filmmaking company. They made a film where they insulted Jesus Christ and St. Mary. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the Austrian government at that time, uh, in time when uh, Austria just joined the European Union, the, um, the Austrian government confiscated uh, the material of Preminger, the filmmaking company, and banned the uh, the diffusion of the of the movie 
and uh, Preminger uh, took uh, the Austrian government to the European Court of Human Rights. And what's interesting is that at that time, what the European Court of Human Rights said is that the confiscation and abandoning of the movie by the Austrian government does not violate the freedom of expression of Preminger. It's completely the opposite how uh, the states in Sweden and uh, Denmark dealt with it, is that the burning of the Quran, uh, where in a country where they have uh, Muslims in the country, were considered was considered also as freedom of expression, and uh, they did not ban uh, actually the act, but uh, actually protected the person who, who does it. So it's, it's very interesting uh, to, to look into cases like this. Uh, it's very hard to find that case because I, I believe that uh, they try as much as, as possible to, to hide it from the public because it's, it's quite... Uh, and I, I hope that the trend also have shifted also in, uh, in the mindset of the European court. And these are the double standards that feed into the narrative of Al-Qaeda as well. Some of it is the same thing, for example, on the treatment of the UK with, uh, in the case of Shamima Begum uh, case, uh, a 15 years old uh, uh, British woman. <laughs> she was born and raised in Britain, but from uh, parents from Bangladesh, uh, but she had only one citizenship. She never been to really to Bangladesh or any linkages to Bangladesh, but she left from the UK to Daesh at the age of 15, suffered, tortured by Daesh, wanted to come back uh, at the age of 21, and she couldn't we go back to, to the UK. What she found is have her the British citizenship have been withdrawn and cancelled by the British government. She was not even allowed to enter the country to, uh, to stand for a case in the UK. Uh, the case went to the European Court of Human Rights and also the European Court of Human Rights considered that uh, the withdrawal of citizenship, the UK citizenship uh, by the British government against uh, Shamima Begum uh, is actually valid. And because uh, Shamima Begum uh, was a threat, national threat to the UK. Uh, and uh, this comes completely, in my opinion, against the international human rights law. Uh, first is that there is no, no one should be uh, uh, left with no citizenship. Uh, at that time, uh, the UK told uh, the government of Bangladesh uh, that she, they told her that she can get the citizenship from Bangladesh, but the Bangladesh government cannot give her citizenship because there, there is a process and she was left actually in a period of time without uh, a citizenship. It's also against the, um, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Article 13, that says no one, everyone has the right to leave their country and return to their country. Uh, she was a British citizen. She can't withdraw the citizenship and say that, no, she cannot come back. It's also against the Article 12 of the International Covenant, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, that actually says no one should be arbitrarily deprived from entering the country. Uh, where they are from. Uh, so the withdrawal of citizenship before Shemim Begum entered the, the UK was actually, in my opinion, a violation of international human rights law. So these are the things that uh, I, I hope that uh, uh, you, you can start looking at it from uh, a research perspective. Uh, and there, there are so many things, uh, so many points that, I, like I said, I have to mention. Uh, which are also challenges to the uh, interlinkages between uh, uh, the fight of violent extremism and the freedoms of religion. Uh, it's one of is uh, the issue of coordination, uh, you know, and uh, the exchange of data. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, the violent extremism is a global issue, and it's also a global uh, reaction and action. Uh, we have seen many countries that need to be uh, exchanging data regarding citizens, uh, but actually have no diplomatic relations. Uh, uh, I think in the region of South Asia, it's very obvious who are the uh, who hold diplomatic relations with who, and the absence of 
uh, exchange of data. It's the same thing also in Africa, you know, talking about North Africa, uh, talking also in uh, now yeah. in uh, Russia and Ukraine, and also uh, the exchange of data between the Sahel, North Africa, and Europe. Uh, Europe has done really well, a little bit impressive, the coordination, such as, for example, the Global Counterterrorism Forum. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of Europeans and exchange of data. And uh, uh, they established even a European Union coordinate, counterterrorism coordinator. One was for 12 years, and now recently one was appointed in 2021. I think he's from Finland. Um, and uh, unfortunately, something like this does not exist in our regions in general, uh, uh, like uh, somebody who can actually or just focus on co coordination regarding the counterterrorism. So the coordination becomes a problem. It becomes even worse when the world is, is going through wars and even more conflicts between countries. So how can we resolve this uh, and focus on um, the, the human security aspect for everyone. So the, the idea of coordination. Uh, the, the second thing is, is about the rehabilitation and reintegration. Uh, we have seen several programs of rehabilitation and integration that goes from the very hard and harsh one, which is the UK model of rehabilitation as a manner, not rehabilitation, it's like the idea, the approach of uh, keeping uh, what they consider as terrorists as uh, away as possible uh, and do not allow them to come in, into the country to uh, the most soft approach that is actually used in uh, in Aarhus in, in Denmark, which is actually uh, a very light uh, uh, rehabilitation programs and uh, with the idea to encourage uh, those who left in to violent extremism in other countries to come back to their countries. The UK approach is the more you keep them away, the more is good for the UK, but it's more bad for for other countries because these people, they will go somewhere else. Either they're go, going to go to another hot spot or to somewhere else. So rehabilitation integration program. And also the way we dealt with rehabilitation as the idea, for example, on trying to change people's minds uh, getting psychologists to look into their ideas and uh, see whether uh, they can be pardoned uh, before the end of their sentence or not. Here is a breach to freedom of thoughts and freedom of holding opinion. It's basically like going back to the 1984 Orwells with the idea of Big Brother looking into people's mind. Actually, this is uh, freedom limited. The idea also is to try to uh, uh, change the understanding of the religious text. So we have religious scholars to go and tell them, no, you, what you understand from, from this religious text is not right, is actually completely opposite here. Is again, it's uh, for every uh, religious scholar has their own way of interpretation regarding the religious text. And then uh, I think it's, it's not the problem there. It, it, it also leads to this, to, to the uh, elevating uh, certain religious scholars to the level of being a new God because they know the right, uh, the, the right interpretation, interpretation as they say. I don't think this is, this is a backfiring, the idea of uh, giving too much power to religious uh, scholars uh, because you are shifting a little bit the religion from being a religion of God to becoming a religion of uh, religious scholars. So that did not really go right. Instead, there will be a little bit more, it should be a little bit more debate and uh, allowing people to express their opinion regarding certain religion and certain interpretation. And also in rehabilitation, there was uh, some approaches regarding how these people have, uh, have been accepted by the society and how much they can actually go back to the society. And here inside the prisons, you know, it's very hard to put a model representative of the society is only when they go out, when you can actually assess whether these people can go back to the uh, to the society or not. So uh, the third point is um, regarding uh, the almost the absence of prosecution regarding uh, crimes of international humanitarian laws. All those who have been prosecuted were prosecuted because they joined a terrorist uh, group, but they have, there is no evidence and there were no prosecution almost 
only very, very minority of people, very few that have been prosecuted in Europe, uh, especially in Germany. Uh, I don't know, maybe Netherlands as well, uh, regarding the international uh, gross violation of human rights, the crime of wars, the crime of against humanity and the genocide. Uh, it's very hard if somebody goes through the rehabilitation programs and we don't know whether, for example, raped a Yazidi woman. And here again, the issue of uh, uh, the importance of having a gender perspective regard the, regarding the thinking about the fight against extremism. I think there are uh, a sense of impunity regarding this. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's very much a, a global phenomenon that it needs to be addressed. Uh, the fourth, what we have tried is the interfaith dialogue. With the interfaith dialogue, with the idea that you know, uh, civilization and religions and faith, they clash and we need to bring them together. As a matter of fact, uh, interfaith dialogue is not about religion, it's about people. And what clashes is not civilizations, but uh, it's actually people. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to assess this interfaith dialogue to what extent they created positive change beyond the signature of certain declarations regarding interfaith. Uh, so this is very important. And uh, uh, like I said, interfaith is more about dialogue and it needs to be assessed uh, uh, scientifically to whether it changes the perspective regarding people being holding uh, or using relig religion for their personal purposes or group purposes. The fifth point, which is one of the challenge is how the international community dropped the prevention approach. Uh, and that how they waited for the conflict to become violent to be able to address it at the same time. Uh, the idea uh, here, there are two ideas. First, uh, there have been said that it's very hard to, to, to measure prevention. To what extent, whatever you do as an organization working on conflict transformation, for example, peace building, you can actually tell us that your action have prevented that, that particular aspect. Well, as Nordic Center for Conflict Transformation, we have our ways of uh, of measuring it, and those are based actually on two main categories of indicators. One is the outcome mapping, we call it, and what the other indicator is proxy indicators. So the outcome mapping is that we agree that if we reach certain outcomes in 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 the project, that is likely to lead to preventing young people from, for example, uh, going to radicalization. This is an example, for example, in the, our project is called Um Action. And we work with mothers uh, and we, 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 we work with them for them to start to detect the early sign of radicalization. And we say, if they know those early signs of radicalization, they can actually, and if they know also the tools on how to deal with their children, to prevent them from going to violent extremism, it's likely that we lead to prevention. This is a kind of outcome mapping that we use. The second one, uh, second indicator that we use to measure prevention, is we call it the proxy indicators. So the proxy is that we, we borrow uh, some, uh, some indicators from different fields of sphere. And we say, if, if this uh, happens, then we can actually say that we prevent violent extremism. One of them is that we say, for example, that sustainable peace cannot uh, 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 be possible without three main elements. One is nonviolence, but also on full realization of human rights and justice. So we borrow indicators from these three different fields. And the more we see that our work impacts positively these three categories of indicators, we say that we actually prevented, we, we are in the process of preventing by, uh, radicalization among young people and how we can actually succeed regarding that. So this is uh, the fifth point regarding prevention and also prevention. Uh, the problem of it is that there is no much funding for prevention aspects because countries, donors, countries are more looking into a short term objective, which is actually the counter terrorism from a security perspective. Uh, and then uh, most of the uh, funding does not go to the prevention aspect. So maybe you guys, you know, 
can work with us and uh, to push uh, uh, donors to be more focused on the prevention aspect because its benefit is much more than the counter and uh, uh, the counter terrorism or counter environmental extremism. Uh, the other one is the blurred lines between violent extremists and mercenaries. Until today, you know, uh, 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 we speak about mercenaries as being one and uh, violent extremists being one, and we don't, there is very blurred line between the two. Uh, and the, there is a need for a real uh, objective separation between these two categories because the approach of their rehabilitation and reintegration and prosecution is completely different. Uh, and um, the seven, problem is how the world have been losing sight uh, of the big picture. People are starting to focus on very small pictures, such as, for example, uh, the war. It's not small, but uh, only, for example, the war in Ukraine. But uh, what's happening in the Sahel is much less important for many countries. <laughs> the same thing is what happening in India or what happening in Bangladesh or what happening in in different countries like Algeria, whatever, people lost sight on the big picture that this is a global phenomenon. And the more we focus on the small aspects of conflicts in the world, we look and losing the, the, the bigger picture, and we are less likely to succeed in the prevention of violent extremism. The eighth point is uh, uh, we have been seeing more and more the emergence of discriminatory language in, in the counter violent extremism field, for example. We have to, for example, what we have here in is the word immunization of, uh, violent, of violent extremism. It's just like you give some kind of shot to some, some kind of people. And uh, for us, this, this, is, uh, this is completely discriminatory. Uh, uh, th this is a human being uh, that you deal with. And uh, in the end, you know, we're talking about the Uyghur, the immunization of the Uyghur, for example, or the immunization of the Rohingyas, or whatever. Uh, th th this is unacceptable language that I consider. And uh, even uh, used, uh, you know, by comparison or, or, or metaphorically, it's, uh, it's unacceptable. Uh, the third, the ninth one is one more point before. It's uh, it's the 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 silenced narratives of how the language of violent extremism have been developing. It's very interesting to look into that because in the first time, in September 11, we start to talk about the war on terror. If you remember, yeah. it's so broad, and I think those countries that were involved in the war on terror so that they cannot actually succeed on that war. So they shifted the language to start talking about countering terrorism. And from countering terrorism, we start to talk about countering violent extremism and then preventing violent extremism. Then we talked about radicalization and then we talked about disengagement. And then they start to talk about demobilization and then rehabilitation and reintegration. And now in, in the field, we talk about resilience. What does that say? It's, uh, the, the hidden narrative of it is that actually we are losing the, the war on terror. They're losing the war on, against violent extremism. And now we're telling people, you know, be resilient. Things are going to happen. And uh, the best you can do is that, you know, you absorb the, the shock and you can get up again and continue your life the way it is. I think this is, uh, this is it. And what that kind of language is perceived by the terrorist groups is that like, you know, linguistically, they are shifting the way we think about how we can win against this bunch. <laughs> and what are the approaches that it needs to be done? Finally, the 10th point that I would like to is, where is peace building in all of that? Where are the organizations that work on peace building that can tell us about this? You know that uh, human rights have seen three generations of human rights. The civil and political rights that in the inter International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The second generation of the rights are the economic cultural rights in the International Covenant on the Economic, uh, Social and Cultural Rights. 
And the third category was actually the uh, uh, collective rights, the right to development, the right to, to self-determination, and the right to environment. So you can see how human rights have been evolving with time. And now we, there is a huge discussion about other rights uh, that involve the new technology, uh, the use of internet and so forth. Democracies also have been shifting uh, uh, from the first wave of democracy, second wave of democracy, the third wave of democracy. There are some, some researchers that spoke about 13 waves of democracy. But in peace building, the only change that has occurred regarding the movement of peace building has been dependent on very specific foreign policies. It hasn't gone to the next level. We are still talking about, for example, compassion and passion and peace and love, uh, but it hasn't been uh, combined with the global movement uh, that uh, other international organizations working on human rights or working on justice system have been uh, reaching. So um, uh, I know a campaign that has been done in the peace building by joining the words peace and building into the dictionary. It was a fantastic campaign, but what we need to join, not only the word, two words, but also our efforts. It's time that the, the peace building need to be evaluated and reassessed. Uh, there is no more, uh, uh, it doesn't work the way we, we used to, to work uh, the, uh, right after the Cold War. Uh, those tools uh, perhaps don't work anymore because the nature of conflicts have shifted from, from being symmetric conflict to asymmetric conflict. We need to start some kind of rethinking the, the, the field of peace building. And this is one of the things why we created the Nordic Center for Conflict Transformation, because we say nonviolence is no longer enough by itself. Nonviolence needs to be joined with the full realization of human rights and justice system. And we join efforts with organizations that work in those particular fields. And the more now we need, we do this, the more we need academics, we need students, we need research to be able to support the, the entire idea. Uh, Dr. Uh, Naomi Sharon, I think, I don't know how much I talked. Perhaps it will be more interesting to engage with the students if they have any questions. Uh, uh, and then perhaps I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lopez. Can you hear me? No, I can't. I can't hear you, Naomi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. So much for each lecture. Um, so we have after lots of information to read. For example, yeah. Dr. Naomi, it's very hard for me to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So thank you so much for your lecture. And we have come to know lots of useful information, uh, especially how a center like Nordic Center for Conflict Transformation mm -hmm. is doing advocacy and lobbying with the stakeholders address this issue which is affecting all of us. So let me start with one question and then I will open the floor for the students. So in your lecture you have said about UN definition of terrorist, 
or terrorism which came after 9-11. So how does that definition differentiate a terrorist from a freedom fighter or someone who has some intention which is related to nationalism or um, you know religious freedom maybe? So does it differentiate or it doesn't like or it's no, unfortunately, there is no no differentiation, and you know that the, uh, the freedom fighter, uh, the terrorists, uh, for ones are the freedom fighters for the others, and uh, there are blurred line between the two. And uh, like I said, the definition under the resolution fifteen sixty six, for example, even though it, it has been tried to be refined and so forth like that, it's uh, unfortunately it's very broad. And uh, we have seen, for example, many people being arrested uh, with the uh, prosecution under terrorism law, and uh, also have been realizing that many people have been uh, 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 freed because uh, there was a realization that there was no uh, involvement really in terrorist activities. You know, many people who were in Guantanamo Bay, by the way, uh, after spending 10 years, 15 years in, in Guantanamo Bay jail, uh, have in the end uh, been uh, said that uh, they were uh, innocent. So unfortunately, this is one of the main points where the academia can actually help us uh, doing is actually to look into the definition and see how we can define terrorism. Uh, even the theory regarding spreading fears, uh, using weapons uh, to uh, scare the public and so forth like that, it's not an accurate, really, uh, definition. One, for example, what do you mean by fear and how can you measure the public fear, for instance, to be able to say that whatever acts is actually spread fear uh, among the public. And the other one is regarding weapon. Uh, and we have seen, for example, the September 11th attacks were not conducted by uh, conventional weapons. They were conducted by planes. Uh, and there was a huge discussion from a legal perspective whether planes can be considered as weapons um, and uh, for the accommodation for uh, legal proceedings, they considered that the use of civil uh, planes, for example, for terrorist um, act, uh, activities can be considered as using weapon. So even that definition, you know, is a little bit, uh, uh, needs to be a little bit more tied up so, but unfortunately, to answer your question, there is no uh, defined lines between freedom fighters and uh, terrorism. Thank you. So, I think the students uh, will have some question now. Um, Um, am I audible? Yes. Okay, yeah. So um, as a society, what strategies or, um, you know, behavioral shifts can we adopt to battle, you know, the challenges that come with religious freedom and uh, extremism? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Maybe there is no one strategy. Maybe this is more of a collective thinking among you. First, you know, we need to uh, contextualize the, the, the problem. Uh, you know, each country have their own context and there is no uh, uh, strategy that come from, from me or from anyone else regarding, for example, issues in, in, in India or anywhere yeah. else, for example, in Morocco, wherever, wherever you know, you talk. You have to to come up with ingrained solutions based on the context in which you are talking, uh, and even uh, solutions at the national level. Sometimes they um, they cannot take into consideration the specificities in certain communities, but in general, in general, uh, uh, people uh, cannot just become a terrorist. Everybody is born human, and terrorism is something that comes because of their, uh, their causes and factors. I think we need to look into that. It has to be something very specific. Like I said, uh, some of the issues relate to the respect of the dignity. Some others, they, they, they relate to the socioeconomic situation of these people. 
But don't forget that in democracies, uh, and India is uh, one of the largest democracies, is uh, democracies are uh, evaluated by the way they treat their minorities. And I think, and I think that one uh, can be one of the factors to look into to what extent the minorities are listened to and uh, they are adopted, or they are completely, you know, sidelined, sidelined in the overall community. So, uh, and that will address what the Daesh is trying to do is the dream of unity. To what extent minorities are feeling, even that they have different opinions and different values and different way of thinking about their life they feel that they are part of a nation, part of country, and part of people they're not discriminated against. This is one of the things that we can look at, you know, slowly into that, to be able to prevent them from, from going to the completely the other side. Because the things that you don't give them, they will find it somewhere else. I hope I answered the question. Hello, Professor. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I just wanted to like bring in a couple of points. And basically, again, building on you know what Professor asked about what's the difference between a terrorist um and a freedom fighter, and you said there is no. Um the, like in the similar fashion, in a similar way, do you think there is a difference between, for instance, a democratic nation and, and maybe um uh, uh, an Islamic state with that has maybe you can say terrorism as you know, like I mean, the like when it's occupying that through terror and all. Yeah, what I'm trying to basically say is that if you look at Israel and Palestine, um, um, the the West sees this uh, uh occupation as a, a recompense to the Jewish people who were persecuted for centuries, while the uh Palestinians see it as European settlers, uh, in Muslim uh, country established with the support of imperialist powers. And of course, uh, uh, you know, terror crimes are also being committed by you know uh, the uh, the Israelis, and uh, it's supported by the uh, government. Uh, I mean, and of course, the U.S. and the West in general. So yeah, that's... yeah. Just to get to your question precisely, what is your question precisely? So how do you see the difference between um, you know a nation that is built on you know? Um, extreme religious ideologies versus a democracy or a secular state that has equally committed, you know, uh, war, war crimes and all on other countries, for instance, U.S. occupying uh, Afghanistan or, you know, killing uh, Iraqis, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, you, you spoke about uh, the difference between also democracy and an Islamic state, right? How do you define an Islamic state? <laughs> Uh, where is an Islamic state? Uh, yeah. uh, like, like I said, uh, there was a study that had been conducted regarding what an Islamic state should look like. And they uh, took, for example, the objectives of Islam as one of the indicators to evaluate whether that, uh, that country is an Islamic or not. And uh, I spoke about the five uh, overall objectives of, uh, uh, of the Sharia, Maqasid the Sharia which has the protection of life, the protection of property, the protection of health, the religion, and dignity. And uh, when they found that, they found that actually those who actually applied those uh, overall objectives as indicators are, in our opinion, they're not uh, Muslim countries, like uh, countries in Scandinavia and so forth, because, you know, when you look at the rate of uh, corruption is low, when you look at uh, the death penalty does not exist, how um, the health of people have been taken care of more than in many other countries. So these are, uh, uh, you know, we need to move away from the categorization based on our uh, personal opinions, but use indicators in a scientific manner. Yeah. Democracy is the same thing. You know, democracy, you're talking about democracy, you're talking about elections. Yeah. Understand? You have seen what the, the, the problem of elections in the US, for instance, you know, whether it was a rugged election or not, <laughs> the fight between the president, it, maybe that we have a crisis of democracy, the rise of far-right political parties. For example, they want to kick off all the migrants uh, from the country. They burn uh, uh, religious texts. They uh, 
uh, they attack uh, uh, migrants in Europe. Uh, and you know that. Is that a democracy? So, you know, really need this. Your question is so important uh, because we need to start reflecting on those kind of things. What are the lines? What are the differences? What are the indicators by which we can say this is a democratic country? This is not. This is an Islamic country. This is not. And the more you're going to do that, the more you're going to come up to something more uh, as a same as a, one of the definitions that you actually, by caring about the people, you are more a democratic country. Uh, uh, as simple as that in the end. But it needs to be deconstructed, have case studies on the most the considered democratic countries. Do you think a democratic country should invade another country, even a democratic country? Do they have the right? They don't, because the international law on use of force, Chapter Seven on the UN Charter, is very clear on on how you can the right to protect. For instance, you cannot invade. And in my opinion, any country that invades any other country is not a democratic country. Because a democratic country should not make the difference between my citizens and your citizens. And my citizens prevail because uh, your citizens are uh, under uh, an autocracy, for instance. That, it, it doesn't make sense. So it will be very interesting if you can actually uh, conduct a, a research regarding that particular point is that to what extent we can say a country is an Islamic and to what extent we can say that a country is democratic. I hope I answered the question. Just one more thing, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you talked about the ultimate goal of Sharia, I, I just personally feel that it is kind of like an Orientalist point of view because you are kind of like taking the Western ideas of freedom of speech and rights um, and trying to uh, view that, uh, you know, like trying to view Islam through that lens. So, if you want to just comment on that, I mean, why why should we take Western ideas as the standards? No, no I don't think I have a Western idea. I think, I think uh, if you look at all Islamic states, are actually all of them that ratified the international human human right law. <laughs> there is no country actually did not ratify the international covenant on civil and political rights, or international covenant on social, cultural, and uh, economic rights. No can Islamic country that I know didn't ratify it. I don't even know about Taliban and so forth like that for, for yeah. now. But all of them, they, are, they put some reservations, for example, on freedom of expression, just to protect their religious belief. But the lines between the, the international human rights law field and the, uh, the Islamic state field is actually very close. For example, I give you an, there is uh, the framework that, that is used by the European Court of Human Rights, which is the margin of appreciation. And that's what has been used, for example, in the case that I've mentioned of uh, Otto Preminger versus Austria, is that they appreciate, they, 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 they conducted, a, they felt that religion is so important at that time in Austria that if they left that movie come out, it's going to disturb the public order. And the, the judges at the European Court of Human Rights have that particular power to do so. Yeah. In, 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 in the Islamic faith, there is something similar as that in the framework. It's called the, the, the concept of maslaha, which is public welfare. Is that they, for example, evaluate, normally they evaluate the situation in which the uh, case occurred and they compared to the context in which whether it's important or not. For example, uh, in terms of uh, uh, apostasy, apostasy in Islam has been evaluated whether the uh, land of Islam was in war or in peace. In time of war, it was assimilated or uh, to, uh, to a spy, you know, <laughs> because it was a religious war. In time of peace, no one has been executed. Uh, in the opposite, it was framed under the freedom of opinion and freedom of religion. So you can see that there is no Western kind of style of, of ideas. And even the word Western is a little bit blurred. What do you mean by Western? <laughs> is it the US? Now the US says, I'm not Western, I'm the US. 
<laughs> uh, Britain, now they did Brexit. <laughs> the Scandinavian, they said, oh, guys, you know, I'm completely different from the rest of France and so forth like that. We don't agree. So even the concept of where is Western is actually deconstructed. And it's very hard to say whether a person is is adopting Western ideas or adopting Muslim ideas because the both of them are completely different and diverse. I hope I Just to explain, Phil, can you please tell us about the implication of ratification? Like what happens yeah. when a country ratifies a particular international convention? What is it? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, the implication of ratification, like if a country sign a particular international convention, what happens? Yeah, uh, so uh, there is uh, two two systems. There is uh, the system by which a country, when they ratify an international convention of human rights, it should be included directly uh, into the national laws without ratification uh, or adoption by the parliament of that particular country or the government. And this is a style of, for example, in countries in Scandinavia, is as soon as they ratify a convention, uh, it goes directly into the uh, national laws. In other countries, even if you ratify a convention, it needs another uh, another step, which is the adoption of that particular uh, convention by the parliament or the government of that particular country. And then there is uh, legal reform. Yeah. And also there are two kinds of countries. There are countries that give primacy to the international human rights law, for example, over the national laws. And that has to be stated very clearly in the constitution. And there are countries that says, no, the national laws actually prevail. Uh, like for example, Morocco in the constitution, we know we, we have uh, uh, very clear that the national law uh, are uh, overcome the national, uh, the national international uh, law overcomes the national law in terms of, for example, human rights. But other countries, they will still look into their national laws. And I was a little bit surprised, for example, in Sweden, uh, that uh, even the burning of the Quran was uh, in international human rights law was quite clear uh, that it's actually an attack against, uh, it's a hate speech, uh, basically. They were still talking about changing some national laws in, in, in Sweden. So these are the two things, but uh, it's very important uh, to make the difference between these two systems uh, because many countries will ratify an international convention and they keep it as a protocol, as an image, without including it into the national laws as a law that will be respected. Is that enough, uh, Dr. Naomi? Yeah, because that shows that why a yeah my audible yeah yes okay uh thank you so much talk my question is a little centered around india so uh, when we talk of terrorist groups and organizations, there is this sense that, you know, marginalization, historical something, and moral corruption. Um, my communities is being used and indoctrinated to get this uh, form of extremism in the minds of, you know, across people in the population. And so the sense comes that, you know, there is the averseness to secularism. So in India, the state is not completely separated from religion. And so how do you think this would impact the relations between the state and outfits? Okay. And yeah. um, my second question, I'll just say both the questions and you can answer them. Um, yeah. Can state also be a terrorist because you have the can 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 what sorry can 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 hate. this uh can this state. State, yes also be a terrorist because you 
have legitimate use of force here and mm-hmm. we're seeing into majoritarianism being used to that extent okay okay i can answer that uh, these are the two questions right these are the yes. two questions that you have yes uh, on the first questions we need the reference to be able to judge who are the terrorists or not and what is the place of religion in terrorism uh, and i talked in the beginning of the presentation uh, about radicalization radicalism extremism violent extremism all of that and uh, if you realize from those definitions those definitions don't actually say that neither radicalization nor violent extremism or terrorism or anything have anything to do with nationalities with ethnicity or with religion none of them as a matter of fact there are very clear um, things that uh, were considered as um, ex- uh, violent extremism such as hate speech for instance uh, and uh, hate speech now is considered as one of the terrorist uh, violent extremist uh, acts and also terrorism as a result of violent extremism so it's it's uh, whether a country can be secular or not i give an example of a secular country such as for example countries in which they have the mountain in great numbers of far right extremists in europe uh, those are secular countries that religion doesn't have to do anything with government of that particular country so I think we need to deconstruct that very quickly. It's that is uh, secularism does not mean anti-terrorism or anti-violent extremism. It actually can be as extremist as anyone else. As a matter of fact, the number, for example, in the US of the number of attacks based on uh, far-right extremism is much more higher than ex- any other kind of extremism you want to talk about. And the same thing in Europe. So it's a... Uh, so we need to look into that based on references, so we don't have to look at it that religion means uh, violent extremism very, you know, uh, straightforward. I give another uh, a country. One of the most peaceful countries in Asia is actually Qatar and Emirates, and those are clearly Muslim countries. Yeah. Uh, there is no secularism in those countries. Uh, maybe we need to reflect about that. Why? Uh, India uh, is considered, for example, 13 after the worst other countries, you know, Afghanistan, Mali, Niger, and stuff. It's a number 13. Uh, we need to reflect that this is a land of Gandhi, of nonviolence, of all these acceptance of the other. There is no differences. We need to reflect into that. What makes us like this? If you look at the report of the Global Terrorism Index, Go to the country specific and you will see the differences. Uh, I'm not defending here or there. I am trying to use a very clear indicator. And that's why I shared with you the Global Terrorism Index of this year. You can look at other years. Uh, I have my opinions about it. Maybe you can uh, tell us about what's missing in those reports, what is not right about those reports. But at least I see that tremendous work has gone into those particular reports. Regarding whether a state can be a terrorist or not. This has been tried for a long period of time to consider, for example, certain states as being terrorist states. But the international community, international, I don't like to use the international community because it seems that we really have a community, but actually we don't. <laughs> uh, the, uh, at the UN, uh, for example, uh, never accepted that a, a, a country can be terrorist. Like, for example, the invasion of Iraq uh, uh, outside the framework of uh, international law and the killing of Saddam Hussein, the president of a country, elected president of a country. Don't you think that those states actually who participated into that are terrorist states? The same thing, those who got involved into the invasion of Libya and the brutal killing of uh, Gaddafi, a head of state, you know, and how those, you know, just pass by just like that. And so, and I can go on and on and on uh, regarding that. Hmm. Do you think uh, the, the, the state of Taliban now in Afghanistan is a, a democratic country or is it, you know, it, if you look into the Global Terrorism Index, it shows who are the terrorist groups 
and Taliban was among them. Understand? <laughs> so how come it, it, it's it's uh, it's a really uh, puzzling question that you have? Maybe you know you need to tell us your own opinion whether the state can be a terrorist or not. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Hi, can you? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, hello, um, my name is Avanti. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, uh, my question is kind of building off of from where the uh, question left off, but in a different from a different perspective. Um, in the sense that I want to understand the legality of state-sanctioned um killings. So, for example, the killing of Osama bin Laden. Um, because I read a paper, a resource paper that was published by Duke, which said that according to international law, it was illegal. But since um the U.S was under threat from the Al-Qaeda and the 9-11 attacks were orchestrated by them. They were within the legal their legal rights to uh, do so, while there were other articles which said that it was illegal in both ways. So I just want to understand the legality of state-sanctioned killings. Um, and can if, if self-defense is the justification, then can that justification also extend to preemptive killings? Yeah, it's a very interesting question because... Uh... And, you know, all those who are initiating it, big leaders of this terrorist organization, we don't get to hear them, you know, we, you know, as in a trial or uh, to say, to see their, what they're thinking there. And also there is nobody, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, first, uh, whether it's legal or not, is it legal to go to a country you know, such as Pakistan, without the authorization of that particular country, and just bomb somebody there in that particular country, where the concept of sovereignty stands. So um, that's one of the things. Second thing is that uh, 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 under international law, this is not uh, legal. But we know that the U.S. also does not did not ratify major uh, convention of uh, international law. Uh, uh, they uh, they act within the this uh, security council uh, and you know all members of the security council actually breach international law themselves and uh, there is no security in the security council really uh, when you look at for example the war in ukraine and how russia which is a member of the security council itself breaches the international uh, law of the security un charter itself <laughs> a lot of people speak about the uh, decline of the UN as uh, an organization that can keep peace and security uh, and it needs to be reformed in a way that other countries from the developing countries can be members uh, of the UN Security Council. So you keep that to five members and if they agree to use nuclear weapon, you know, does the U.S. was allowed to use nuclear weapon in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Is like, <laughs> and how the U.S., for example, can talk about no country need to use the weapon? So it's a it's a very complex thing, and I'm I'm not quite critical in terms of uh, the way the United Nations functions under the current uh, U.N. Security Council. The world is not doing great, and uh, it was a commitment uh, after the World War II that the only way to prevent another third world war is to have international law, UN Charter, and uh, we have to have the perspective on international human rights law. And we ask all countries to come together to ratify and agree, this is the way we're gonna do it. This is the way to be able to use force and the right to protect. Uh, it has to be done according to the UN Charter. Countries came together, we did this, but yet, we saw at least three wars in Europe. There is the war in Kosovo, the war in Armenia against uh, uh, Uzbekistan, and the war now in Ukraine, and the wars in uh, in Sahel, and the involvement of uh, mercenaries, uh, Wagner Group, private security, military companies, actually coming from members of the UN Security Council. So I don't know, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, 
I think uh, the extreme is becoming mainstream <laughs> in the international law, which actually it's becoming normal to breach the international law by the members of the UN Security Council, then actually respect the international law in itself, as if the international law is only for developing countries, not for the members of the UN Security Council. So this is my opinion. <laughs> I think um, there is a, another question on preemptive self-defense. Like, yes. You... Yes. The concept of preemptive self-defense came actually during the September 11. The idea is that we go where we go to prevent those to come to, to bomb us. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you think that uh, even, you know, the idea of self-defense comes from uh, the private law, from the criminal penal law, uh, and the idea that a penal is very restrictive in, 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 in the idea of self-defense. Like if you want to self-defense, any act that comes after preventing that, uh, that attack is not considered as uh, self-defense, is considered as a homicide. <laughs> but in international law, they don't have that particular break. Uh, they go, they bomb, and they come back. Do they? prevent uh, self-defense in Iraq and Syria? No, it just backfired actually. <laughs> it became more problem. More people died after uh, the war in Afghanistan than people who died in September 11th. <laughs> if you, you count the number of deaths. So that now we don't talk about uh, preemptive self-defense. If you, you look at it, it hasn't been used. It was only a vehicle for a war in Afghanistan at that time and a war in Iraq. And then we, we uh, lawyers have been criticizing it. And uh, a lot of feminist uh, groups have been criticizing it because most of the time who are victims of those wars are women and children. Men, they can escape. Right? If you count the number of women who died in Kosovo, for example, under the framework of uh, uh, right to protect, you know, you have planes at 32, 35,000 uh, feet dropping bombs. You know, the precision is not good enough. It was so bad that they actually bombed Al Jazeera. They bombed, they bombed the Chinese embassy in Kosovo. This is, and of course, what they call people at that time, they call it collateral damage. Yeah, how human being can become collateral damage. Most of that collateral damage that they call are women and children. These are not collateral damage, they are human beings. Same thing in Afghanistan. Nobody talks about the number of women who died in wars. Same thing about uh, Iraq. And one of the things that I hope to see is a global terrorism index, a global peace index that are segregated per gender. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it doesn't exist until today. So then, uh, in my opinion, preemptive self-defense was only a tool of war at that time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your lecture. Hopefully you enjoyed. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me and thank you so much for the interesting questions. <laughs>